So another year, another CES. Uh, I'm David McKenzie with HDTV Test, and we're off the show floor once again, getting deja vu here with uh, uh, Jason Hart, love of Nanesis. So last year, you uh, you explained to us, uh, gave us a refresher in quantum dot technology. Uh, what's what's changed in a year? What can we uh, expect to see in the future? So a, a number of things that we've talked about last year are actually going to be coming to market this year in terms of products. So quantum dots, as you know, have been used in a backlight so far. So we create the perfect red, green, blue backlight, and that allows for much higher efficiency because the light that's being generated doesn't contain any of the spectra that's suppressed by the color filters. So for example, we don't create a lot of yellow light like a traditional phosphor does. Therefore, all that light energy that would be, you know, in a traditional phosphor is suppressed by the red, green, blue color filter. In our case, we only create red, green, and blue light, and that passes through with high efficiency. Very nice narrow peaks, which gives you nice color saturation, which is pleasing to the, the viewer. And this is the technology as it's been implemented so far. What we're gonna see this year is a number of new implementations, the most exciting of which is where we're gonna move the quantum dots from the backlight to actually at the exit uh, pupil of the LCD. And so this is enabled by a number of new technology innovations we've been working with with our partners. And what that's going to mean is that the light, instead of being red, green, and blue, or white, red, green, and blue light, coming through the modulator and then being filtered into either red, green, or blue subpixel light at the exit pupil, you're going to have blue light go through the modulator all the way, come to the exit pupil, and then be converted. 100% of the blue photons are going to be converted at each subpixel to either red or green or blue, depending upon the color of the subpixel. So efficiency increases greatly, but in beyond that, the because the light is now being emitted at the exit pupil, you have basically perfect color across the entire viewing angle. And so this really gives you a much better viewing experience. So great off-axis viewing, perfect color, no color shift, and you know again, that same kind of uh, efficiency boost that we talked about, uh, that's gonna allow for even brighter sets without increasing the power consumption. So, you know, all of this, we see that coming to, to mass production products this year. None of those being announced at, at CES this year, but uh, we do believe that those will be announced at IFA. They are being, some of those products are being shown privately in some of the uh, manufacturers' uh, private suites. And uh, I, I've seen them and they, they just really look fantastic. I can't wait to, 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 to buy one myself, so. Well, I mean, I think last year, pretty much every question I asked you was, um, when are we going to see emissive displays? When, when is there going to be something emissive? Because obviously LCD is a mature technology. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a reliable technology, but it's not without its flaws. Um, I, th I guess what you're describing is, uh, a, you know, a next evolution that's not quite an emissive display, but absolutely, like you said, rectifies some of the viewing angle limitations of current LCD. Well, in a way, we, we actually kind of, you know, are branding this or calling this photo emissive because it is an emissive display technology. The emitter is right there at the, at the surface, right? And so either the emitter is energized if it gets blue photons striking it or it's not energized if the blue photons are shut off by the LC, right? So that is an emissive display technology. The difference between OLED, for example, is you energize those emitter uh, materials by driving holes and electrons into them. So they're electrically pumped. This is optically pumped, but an optically pumped emissive display, nonetheless, looks to the user like an emissive display. So it's photo emissive instead of electro emissive. Uh, of course, we continue to work on developing electrical pumping of quantum dots as well. And so those are the ultimate QLED or QD LED technologies. And we've made a great deal of progress on that but those are still several years away from being in a mass production kind of a mode. But this photo emissive technology will be coming. It does leverage all of the benefits of the LCD infrastructure in terms of cost, in terms of yield, in terms of ability to do very large size panels. All the capacity that's out there can be made, can be converted to use this kind of photo emissive technology. So it really is giving the LCD technology, which is traditionally more of a transmissive technology, 
a new life as a more emissive technology, just a photoemissive one. Picking up in your comment about uh, improved viewing angle, with current LCD, obviously, especially with VA panels, you can, you know, my, the example I gave was you can look at a, a full field of red or, you know, 100% saturated red, green, or blue. And as you move around the room and look, in, look at the display, the hue and the saturation fall off quite rapidly okay. from, from the center. And obviously you're saying that that's going to be completely, completely fixed. But my question is, what about the absence of light? I mean, we've all, you know, you can look at a, any LCD display and when there's a black screen, for example, that has issues with off-axis viewing as well. And you've, you've, the, the, the new uh, structure you've described um, will improve the, the, the off-axis quality when there's no color on screen at all? Yeah, so th this is an implementation detail, but we believe that uh, just like with OLED, uh, there will be some form of a polarizer that will be on the front of the screen to deal with that ambient light, creating that kind of appearance of you know a, a gray or a purple or a, an off color uh, it, when you have a black screen, right? And so with the, the presence of that polarizer or, or a technology like a polarizer on the front of the panel, uh, that will be suppressed. And again, we've seen that, uh, I've seen that in some of the, the uh, products that are being developed and uh, yeah, I don't see any problem with off-axis black. Looks great, just like it looks uh, with the OLED technology using this kind of photoemissive technology. So really great contrast ratio, uh, all of the things that you, you see from OLED, but with a lot of the manufacturability uh, benefits of LCD um, in terms of price point, in terms of also being able to get to extremely high brightness levels um, you know, HDR levels of 2,000 nits should be no problem, even above that, I think manufacturers will go. Um, so, you know, that, I think that, that um, how people handle this may vary from, from manufacturer to manufacturer. So maybe some manufacturers may not put as good of a polarizer on there, and you might have a little bit of, you know, uh, color, color error off axis on the black. But certainly it is possible to make that off-axis color, off-axis black look very, very perfect. Um, and we've seen that. So, so of course, uh, you know, HDR, it's not going anywhere. And I guess now we're getting into kind of arms race of who has the brighter display. Um, can you talk to that? I mean, what kind of, um, you, you discussed the changes to the structure of the panel. What kind of increases could we see from, from that regarding, uh, you know, how, how is that going to play into peak light output? Sure. So I think, you know, as, as you know, you could make a 20,000 nit or a 50,000 nit front of screen brightness display if you wanted to. You would have, you know, a lot of thermal management issues and a lot of power issues to deal with because the efficiency of the light that's generated in the backlight versus what comes out the front, that becomes the big limiting issue, right? Not really the, the brightness per se, but how much of your light energy is actually getting out to the user. By moving to this technology, which doesn't use color filters anymore, and instead all of your photons, which are going through your modulator, are being converted to photons that eventually make it out to the eye, right? That's a tremendous increase in the efficiency of the panel, right? And so that should allow for multiples of the brightness that you see today without dramatic increases in the power, right? So if you can get to today's sets, for example, without using things like active cooling, you know, we're seeing sets on the show floor of 1,000 nits, 1,500 nits, 2,000 nits, you know, that level of performance with a higher efficiency by use of uh, quantum dot uh, color filter uh, replacement, or we call color converters, uh, you know, we could see that more than double, I think, right? And that's going to be very, very exciting because, again, you know, we don't want to boost up those power uh, input power. You know, we don't want the sets to consume more energy. We don't want the sets to, you know, require any kind of active cooling, et cetera. We don't want them to become a lot more expensive. So, you know, definitely this will enable much brighter uh, peak brightness out of out of these sets. It's really the order of the day, isn't it? More, bigger color gamuts, bigger brightness, bigger, better. Well, we talk about increased color volume, really. You know, we think about that as the most important thing. Um, adding things like a white subpixel, right, and w, doing WRGB is a way to get more brightness. But you lose color information in the process of doing that, right? You basically are taking 25% of your, of your 
color information and throwing it away because now you're replacing that with just white light information. And photons are photons, and yeah, you, you sense that brightness. But if you really want to make a bright, you know, fire, for example, fire is a great example, fire, lava, all of these types of things that are natural phenomena, they're not actually bright white when you look at them. They're bright and colored, right? And so how do we create that? We need more color volume, which means both more color and brightness of those colors. And so this is, this is definitely, you know, moving us more towards the types of things that we see in the natural world, right? We see those bright colors reflected off of surfaces, off, reflected off of, you know, rocks or whatever. Here we are in Las Vegas, you go, you know, just a few miles away, you can see these beautiful sandstone formations that are, that are incredibly bright in the middle of the day, right, when the sun's beating down on them, but they're not white, Right? And if you, if you showed them as with, with the full dynamic range using a white subpixel, you'd really get a, a, a very poor imitation of reality. So you know, we're looking forward to, again, seeing that uh, in products, great viewing angle, great brightness, great efficiency, huge color volume. Well, all of that, it's like it's the video file dream, really, isn't it? Um, I guess to go back to manufacturing, since this is, you know, it's, no, you know, adding quantum dots to, a, you know, the existing LCD process, it's not a brand new type of panel. It's, uh, I guess you could say, an evolution of an existing technology. What, because this will, of course, impact the price that, you know, consumers or readers eventually pay for these next gen LCD products. Um, how how much of a reinvention of the the manufacturing process is this? Can you take an existing LCD line and fairly easily you know add this new stuff to it? Yeah. So the the integration of the quantum dots into the LC panel itself, rather than being part of the backlight, is something we've worked on the material side to make sure that our materials are fully compatible with those manufacturing processes. So that piece of the uh, solution is is well in place. What we see is that there's additional light management uh, uh, issues that have to be dealt with because now we're putting the emitter basically in a different place than it's traditionally been. And so the liquid crystal panel, as you know, makes use of polarized light in order to modulate the light on and off. Well, quantum dots don't emit polarized light. And so if we have the quantum dots in a location now close to where the LC is actually at, it can mess up the LC shutter. So we have to basically move the polarizer as well, for example, right? So those technologies have been under development for many years, and they are being put into those existing uh, LCD fabs. Um, they're, not, uh, they're not new technologies, but they are technologies which are on the, the LCD fab evolutionary model because they actually help reduce the overall cost of making the panel versus having the polarizers outside the uh, liquid crystal glass where they are today. They basically are a separate component. They're a costly component. And by integrating them into the cell, then uh, that cost of the, the polarizer will certainly go down. And uh, that, that type of architecture is necessary in order to manage the stray light effects of having the quantum dots now in the cell. So. You know, those are small changes that need to be made in the LCD factory um, and, you know, single tool types of changes that need to be made. And we do see those happening across multiple different manufacturers um, with, the, with the large fabs. So, uh, Jason, the future of LCD, I've never been so uh, looking forward to improvements for a technology that's been around so long. But, um, you know, another year, we're a year closer. Um, sounds exciting. <laughs> Thank you for talking to us. You're welcome, Matt. We're very excited about it. We can't wait to see some of these products out there on the market. So, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.